So, in the previous class, we uh, looked at a worked example and we will continue to work it out in this uh, class. So, we looked at a ramjet engine and the free stream conditions were given like this. So, free stream state we uh, denoted as A and uh, P A was given to be 12 kilo Pascal and T A was uh, given to be 217 Kelvin and the uh, velocity V A was given to be 738 meter per second. So, let us determine the free stream Mach number M A. So, the free stream Mach number M A is given as V A divided by square root of gamma times R times T A and uh, because this is air we take gamma to be 1.4. So, I can evaluate this as 738 divided by square root of 1.4 times C p or I can also write this in terms of let me write this in terms of uh, the given values which is C p and uh, gamma are given. So, I can write this as 0 0.4 times C p which is 1005 times 217. And if I calculate this uh, number, if I substitute the values, I get this to be 2.5. So, the free stream Mach number comes out to be 2.5. And uh, based on this, I can calculate the free stream stagnation pressure P0A using the isentropic relationship. So, this is P0A is equal to PA plus PA times 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 times MA square raised to the power gamma over gamma minus 1. And if you substitute the values, we get P A, uh, P0A to be 205 kilo Pascal. And the stagnation, the free stream stagnation temperature can be calculated as follows. T0A is equal to TA times 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 times MA square. And once again substituting the values, we get the stagnation temperature to be 488 Kelvin. So, these are the free stream conditions or conditions at entry to the intake. So, at the exit of the uh, intake, we denote this as uh, state 1. Since there is no uh, heat or work addition, the stagnation temperature remains the same. So, T01 is equal to T0A is equal to 488 Kelvin. And in order to calculate uh, P01, we need to use the military specification. And if you remember, we had written it down like this. So, the pressure recovery was equal to 1 for Mach number less than or equal to 1 and this was equal to 1 minus 0 0.075 times M A minus 1 raised to the power 1.35 for Mach numbers lying between 1 and 5 and uh, it was equal to 800 divided by M A raised to the power 4 plus 935 for Mach number greater than 5. So, in the present case since the Mach number is uh, 2.5 we use this relationship and if I use this relationship then I get P01 is equal to eta r times P0a and uh, the value for eta r comes out to be 0 0.87. So, 0 0.87 times P01 which we calculated as 205 kilo Pascal. So, this uh, comes out to be 178 kilo Pascal. So, we have calculated both uh, stagnation temperature and stagnation pressure at the end of the intake. Now, we go to the combustor. So, at the exit to the combustor, we 
the stagnation temperature is given to be 2100 Kelvin. So, T02 is equal to 2100 Kelvin and it is given that there is a 8 percent loss of stagnation pressure in the combustor. So, which means that T02 is equal to 0 0.92. So, that is 1 minus 0 0.08 uh, because it, there is a 8 percent loss of stagnation pressure. So, 0 0.92 times P01 and if you substitute the values you get this to be 164 kilo Pascal. So, now we have uh, come to the nozzle. So, this is the stagnation pressure at entry to the nozzle. So, let us evaluate the critical pressure. So, P e critical is given as P 0 2 times 1 minus 1 over eta nozzle times gamma g minus 1 divided by gamma g plus 1 the whole thing raised to the power gamma g over gamma g minus 1. Eta nozzle is given in the problem statement to be 0 0.97 gamma g is also given. So, if you substitute the numbers we get the critical pressure to be 86.86 kilo Pascal or 87 kilo Pascal approximately. The ambient pressure if you recall the uh, ambient pressure is given to be 12 kilo Pascal right. So, this was the ambient pressure. So, since the critical pressure is greater than the ambient pressure the nozzle is choked and it is also given that uh, we are asked to look at two conditions one convergent nozzle two convergent divergent nozzle ok. So, if it is a convergent nozzle then since P critical is greater than P ambient. nozzle is, is choked. So, the exit pressure is thus equal to P e is equal to P e critical equal to 87 kilo Pascal. And the exit static temperature can be calculated T e can be calculated by using the fact that the Mach number is 1. So, this is going to be T 0 2 divided by I am sorry this is 2 over gamma g plus 1 times T 0 2. And if you substitute the values you get this to be 1803 Kelvin. So, now that I have the static temperature I can calculate the exit velocity V e as follows square root of 2 times C p g times T 0 2 minus T e and this if you substitute the numbers this works out to be 826 meter per second. In fact, uh, in this case since the nozzle is choked you could also have calculated this as square root of gamma g times r times T e that will also give you the same value because m is equal to 1 right. So, this is also equal to both will be the same if you calculate using both ways it is ok because we have already made use of this fact when we wrote this expression and when we wrote this expression we already used the fact that m is equal to 1.
right. So, both will give the same number, there are no issues here. So, the specific thrust can be evaluated. T over m dot is equal to V e minus V a plus R g times T e divided by P e times V e times P e minus P a. So, if you remember this uh, term corresponds to A e divided by m dot that is what this term corresponds to. Right. So, let us just quickly take a look at this term. So, if you remember this is equal to A e over m dot right and m dot itself is equal to rho e a e times v e and that is how we have simplified this term. So, if you substitute the numbers the specific thrust comes out to be 88.37 plus 535.5 which works out kilo newtons which works out to a total of I am sorry kilo this is Newton second per kg. So, this works out to a total of 623.87 Newton second per kg. So, you can see that the pressure thrust dominates in this case because we have used a conversion nozzle and the exit pressure is far above the ambient pressure. So, this says that uh, ideally in this case we should be using a conversion diversion nozzle right which is what we are going to do next. Now, before we do that we uh, are also asked to calculate the uh, thrust specific fuel consumption right. So, we can do that by uh, uh, calculating the fuel flow rate. So, an energy balance for the combustor gives m dot C p times T 0 1 this uh, we assume steady state operation here. So, m dot C p times T 0 1 is equal to m dot plus m f dot times C p g times T 0 2 minus m dot f times h. So, here we are applying the steady flow energy equation to the combustor and coming up with this equation and if you substitute the uh, if you rearrange then we can calculate m f dot over m dot as follows. So, m f dot over m dot comes out to be C p g times T 0 2 minus C p times T 0 1 divided by H fuel minus C p g times T 0 2. Notice that in this term m dot plus m f dot I can uh, neglect m f dot in comparison with m dot. So, I have taken this to be equal to m dot itself. So, this is reasonable we have been doing this. So, I have taken this term to be equal to m dot itself. So, if you calculate this value this comes out to be 0 0.045 under ideal conditions right. So, this is nothing but m f dot over m dot under 
ideal conditions. Combustion efficiency is given, so M F dot <coughs> actual is equal to M F dot ideal divided by combustor efficiency. So, the combustor efficiency is given to be in the problem statement, uh, it is given to be 0 0.8. So, which means that I have actually have to burn more fuel to get the uh, same change in stagnation temperature. So, this comes out to be 0 0.05625. So, what this tells me is that under ideal circumstances I would have had to burn only 0 0.045 times m dot to achieve the peak temperature of 2100 Kelvin, but because the combustor is not 100 percent efficient I have to burn this much fuel to realize the same peak temperature that is what this means. So, TSFC is equal to m f dot over m dot divided by T over m dot and uh, for this I get this to be 0 0.325 to substitute the numbers you get this to be 0 0.325 kg per Newton hour. So, we are asked to do this calculation assuming the nozzle to be convergent and assuming the nozzle to be convergent divergent. So, we have done the calculation and calculate, uh, calculated specific thrust if it is a convergent nozzle. Now, this part will not change irrespective of the nozzle this remains the same. So, we will now do the calculation assuming the nozzle to be convergent divergent which means the exit pressure is not going to be 87 kilo Pascal, but it will be expanded in the nozzle up to the ambient pressure. So, the exit pressure will be 12 kilo Pascal and not uh, 87 kilo Pascal that is what we are going to do next. So, if the nozzle is a CD nozzle with expansion to the ambient pressure, then P E is equal to P A is equal to 12 kilo Pascal. So, we need to calculate either T e or V e any one of these uh, two things will do. So, we make use of the factor T 0 2 over T e s is equal to P 0 2 over P e s to the power gamma g minus 1 divided by gamma g because state point E s and state point 0 2 lie on the same isentrope. If you go back and look at our uh, thermodynamic diagram for the nozzle, you will see that these two are on the same isentrope. Furthermore, for the nozzle, we also said that P E S is equal to P A because A and E S lie on the same isobar, right. So, P E S is equal to uh, P E in this case, right. P E S is equal to P E. So, if I substitute the values, then I can calculate T E s from this. So, this says that T E s can be calculated, but I can actually uh, I need not calculate this explicitly I can calculate the exit velocity by just using this ratio. So, V E s square is equal to is equal to 2 times C P G times T 0 2 minus T E s I am sorry there is no square root here because this is V E s square. And if I pull out the T 0 2 from this this can be written as 
2 C P G T 0 2 times 1 minus T E S over T 0 2. This is V E S square and we know the nozzle efficiency. So, I can now calculate V E square from the definition of the nozzle efficiency. Let us go ahead and uh, do that. Since eta nozzle is equal to V E square over 2 C P G divided by V E S square over 2 C P G, I can get V E to be And if I substitute from there, I get this to be 2 times eta nozzle times CPG times T02 times 1 minus TES over T02. I have substituted for VES square from there, and if you plug in the numbers, you get this velocity to be 1494 meter per second. You may recall that when we used a conversion nozzle for the same conditions, the exit velocity was about 820 meter per second. So, now it is 1 point almost 1.5 kilometer per second. And if you go ahead and calculate the thrust now, specific thrust, So, the specific thrust in this case there is no pressure thrust only momentum thrust. So, this is V e minus V a. So, this comes out to be 756 Newton second per kg. So, if you compare that with this number, you can see that this represents an improvement of nearly 25 percent almost 623 that is 756 that is about 130. So, that is about uh, more than 25 percent improvement in this. Okay. Can come and someone tell me what this improvement is? I think it is more than 25 percent. Twenty-one percent. Twenty-one percent. Twenty? 1.3. Okay, fine. So, that is an improvement of 21 percent. Good. And TSFC will change for this case, absolute fuel flow rate will not change, but TSFC will change for this case. So, TSFC is equal to MF dot divided by M dot, which remains the same divided by T over M dot which has changed now. So, this is the same as before, right. So, M f dot over M dot is the same as before. So, that is 0 0.05625 divided by T over M dot now has become 756. So, this comes out to be 0 0.268 kg per hour compared to 0. 325 before. So, obviously, this is better because for burning the same amount of fuel, I am now getting higher specific thrust. So, definitely using a convergent divergent nozzle in this case is definitely better. Any questions? Okay, so, that brings us to the last uh, module in the course. We have seen up to ramjets. What we are going to do now is take a look at scramjets.
So, in the last module, we are going to uh, take a look at a scramjet technology. So, if you remember, uh, one of our earlier slides, you know, we, uh, we listed um, flight Mach number versus technology. So, we started with uh, propeller for low subsonic flight Mach numbers. Then we said turbojet for high subsonic flight Mach numbers, turbojets and turbofans. Then uh, we said after burning turbojets uh, for uh, going past the uh, sound barrier for brief periods of time for supersonic flights. And then uh, we said turbo ramjet for sustained flights at uh, low subsonic Mach numbers. Then from that we said ramjets for sustained flights at uh, supersonic Mach numbers up to about 2, 3 or so. Now, for flight Mach numbers beyond this value, generally beyond 4 or 5, uh, ramjet technology is not really suitable. So, that is when we start looking at something called scramjet technology. Okay? Why is ramjet technology not suitable? So, that is what we are going to see today. So, when the flight Mach number, uh, Mach number goes beyond 5, okay? remember uh, when we talked about uh, thrust and we said you know we have to import a velocity change to the fluid after it goes through the engine. And we said that this velocity change can be accomplished by increasing the specific enthalpy of the air or specific enthalpy of the fluid. And we increase the specific enthalpy of the fluid by increasing its pressure and by increasing its temperature because enthalpy is nothing but u plus pv. So, we increase u by increasing t and then we increase p. Right? So, you increase the specific enthalpy of the fluid and then in the nozzle you convert the specific enthalpy to kinetic energy. So, that allows the uh, engine to produce thrust. Right? So, conversion of enthalpy to kinetic energy is the critical part in realizing the increase in enthalpy as uh, thrust. Okay? Now, when the flight Mach number uh, exceeds 5, okay, if you use ram ramjet technology, right, you decelerate the air to subsonic uh, Mach number at the exit of the intake. From a flight Mach number of 5 or 6, if you decelerate it to a subsonic Mach number at the end of the intake, uh, remember as the pressure increases in the intake, the temperature also increases. If you decelerate it all the way to a subsonic Mach number, then the temperature of the air entering the combustor becomes very high because of the amount of deceleration that you are doing. Okay? Unfortunately, when the temperature entering the combustor itself becomes very high, if you try to increase its enthalpy by adding further heat, this does not go towards in increasing the enthalpy of the fluid, it actually causes dissociation of the fluid. So, the energy that you are putting in goes not towards increasing the internal energy or the, the energy that you are putting in ideally should increase u which is the internal energy. Instead of doing that, what happens is the energy goes towards breaking the bonds of the molecules in the fluid. So, once the molecules are broken, the energy that is used for breaking the molecules is no longer available for conversion to kinetic energy in the nozzle. Remember our idea was to increase the enthalpy in the combustor and then extract that increase in enthalpy as energy, kinetic energy in the nozzle. But in the combustor, the energy that you put in goes towards dissociating the molecules. When this fluid comes to the nozzle, you will have only dissociated molecules. So, you cannot recombine these molecules and recover the enthalpy, it is not possible. So, the uh, use of ramjet technology for flight Mach numbers exceeding 5 is not feasible because the increase in temperature itself is so high. So, what we do in this case is we decelerate the air not to subsonic flight Mach numbers, but only to Mach numbers around 2 to 2.5 that is reasonable. The increase in temperature in this case is also reasonable that there is scope for further increase in enthalpy and increase in temperature which can be converted to kinetic energy in the nozzle. Right? So, we decelerated only to Mach numbers around 2 to 2.5. If you do that, the implication is that the combustion should take place in uh, air that is moving at a supersonic speed okay? and that is where the name supersonic combustion ramjet comes from. Okay. In the ramjet combustor, the combustion takes place at subsonic Mach numbers, whereas in the scramjet engine, the combustion must, uh, must take place at supersonic speeds. This is an extremely challenging task, both this and designing the intake. If you remember, we said that in ramjet, the most critical component is the intake and in a scramjet also, the most critical component is the intake. 
In addition now, we have added to the list of critical components the combustor also because of the technical challenge of uh, having sustained combustion and heat release in air which is moving at supersonic speeds. This is somewhat uh, uh, difficult to swallow because if you remember the ramjet engine has only three parts or three components. What are the three components? The intake, the combustor and the nozzle. The scramjet engine also has only three components, intake, combustor and nozzle. So, if two out of the three components are very critical, you can imagine how challenging the task is going to be. Okay? And let us see uh, what, what is being attempted to realize this technology. So, here you are looking at a scramjet vehicle. Okay? So, here you see the complete vehicle with the uh, control surfaces and here you see a uh, side view of this uh, vehicle and you can see the long almost isentropic kind of intake to decelerate the air from Mach numbers may be 6 or 6.5 or 7 to perhaps 2 or 2.5. So, this is the four body where external compression takes place. So, you can see this uh, curved surface uh, which is going to generate oblique shocks which will compress the free stream air and then feed it into the into this engine. So, this is the engine. Okay, so, this part of the engine is the intake, internal compression intake, you have combustor and then interestingly enough, this part is the nozzle, the nozzle is not enclosed. Okay, in this case, normally the nozzle is not enclosed and the flow expands against this surface. Just like this surface compresses the air which is moving this way, expansion against this surface will produce thrust which will, ex which will be a force exerted on this surface in this direction from right to left. These types of nozzles are called single expansion ramp nozzles. These are completely open and the expansion takes place against the upper surface of the vehicle. Okay, having additional uh, surfaces in this case will increase the drag tremendously. Remember, we are talking about free stream flight Mach numbers of 7 or so. So, if you enclose this nozzle, that means those surfaces are going to experience drag at such high speeds which is why they are left open and expansion takes place only against this surface, which is why the nozzle actually is not a critical component, relatively straightforward. Okay. What is critical is this intake and this combustor. Okay, so, it is, it is extremely simple aerodynamically and it is supposed to develop thrust which will allow it to fly at sustained flight at Mach numbers around 7 or so. Okay. So, here, but as we said earlier, the uh, ramjet or the scramjet, because it does not have a compressor, it cannot take off or land on its own. So, it has to be taken up to the, the design flight mark number and then released, only then it will start operating. So, here you see the, uh, so this is the scramjet, which is mounted in front of this uh, missile. The missile itself is mounted underneath the wing of an uh, ordinary aircraft. So, the aircraft takes this entire thing up to altitudes of about 30,000 uh, feet or so and then this missile is launched. So, the missile then boosts this to the required altitude of about uh, maybe 30 kilometers or so and then the missile is disengaged and at that point the intake is opened and the scramjet will start flying at the designated altitude and flight speed. Okay, so, this is like a two stage launch, first stage is using this aircraft, second stage is using this missile. Okay. So, here you see a close up view of the scramjet vehicle that I showed earlier. So, you can see the intake here and you see the engine which is uh, mounted over here, and then you see the whole thing being mounted on this missile okay. and the whole thing is underneath this wing of this aircraft. Okay, that gives you an idea about the size and so on. Okay, this is an experimental aircraft. In fact, this aircraft, this technology uh, is being tried for nearly 20 to 30 years now. Okay, engineers have been trying to realize this technology for more than 30 years now. And only last year, this vehicle that I showed, this is an artist's uh, conception, but the vehicle that I showed in this uh, in this figure, this scramjet vehicle on May 1st, 2013, it actually had 
sustained hypersonic flights for only 3 minutes that is the current record for sustained hypersonic flight at Mach 5 for 3 minutes is the current record. So, you can see how far we have come and how far we have to go. Okay. So, to realize this commercially or even for other purposes is going to be a tremendous challenge. Okay. This is the state of the art today. What we will do is look at some of the challenges that uh, people are trying to overcome. Supposedly, this technology, uh, the next intended application for this technology is obviously for missiles okay, because these are smaller, they are not ready to take uh, passengers or they cannot, they are not in a stage where they can be used for commercial aviation purposes. So, the first technology is to uh, use this for uh, missiles which actually will require only a uh, short amount or small amount of thrust to be produced by the engine. Okay, so, that is the current uh, application that uh, people are looking at, but is the fact that we have sustained hypersonic flight only for 3 minutes tells you how challenging this technology is despite the fact that this is being, this has been tried for more than 30 years now. This is what uh, India is trying to develop. This is the hypersonic technology demonstrator vehicle that DRDL has been developing. Hopefully, this will be test flown maybe later this year or early part of next year. This is designed for uh, a flight uh, Mach number around 6 to 6.5 at altitudes of about 30 to uh, 35. Okay. You can see the uh, clean aerodynamics, the single expansion ramp nozzle on this side. Uh, you see the intake and four body and the intake and then the engine itself here. This is the engine. Okay. We will talk about uh, differences between the Indian, the Indian design and the American design as we go along. Okay. So, here is a nice uh, sketch of the, uh, of the scramjet engine. This engine is uh, what is called a propulsion airframe integrated scramjet. What this means is that the entire uh, body is a lifting body. So, the airframe is a lifting body and the engine is actually part of the body. That is why uh, we use the word propulsion airframe integrated. You can see that the uh, general idea is to have compression on the fore body of the engine which is nicely designed and then expansion against the aft body of the engine which is also designed properly. So, that is an expansion surface and the supersonic flow expands against that expansion surface producing thrust. Okay. So, and you can see that you can either have one single engine which develops the entire thrust or you can have a modular approach where you have many such engines, smaller engines which are stacked together, arranged next to each other. So, you can have each module producing a small amount of thrust with some number of modules arranged side by side and that is what you are seeing here. Okay. Both approaches are feasible, different countries are trying out different things. Okay. So, a cross sectional view of this flow path that is shown here looks like this. So, you can see the, the fore body and the compression of the free stream in the fore body and then internal compression here through reflected shocks and also passages. And then you have a combustor where fuel is injected, combustion and heat release takes place and then you have expansion against the aft body. In some cases, the uh, cowl, this component is called a cowl, the cowl may extend up to the end of the nozzle or in some cases the cowl may be terminated at the end of the combustor. Both are possible, many different, it depends on the aerodynamics of the vehicle. So, this is the nozzle and this is the expansion surface. So, as the supersonic flow comes like this, then it is made to go like this, you know that that is a convex corner. So, the flow will expand against that, so that is what it does. What is that? In between the inlet and the combustor, we have something new called the isolator. What is the uh, function of this isolator? Right? If you remember, we talked about Rayleigh flow. Right? If, in a, if you add heat in a supersonic flow and remember in this case, the flow entering the combustor is supersonic. Right? We said that the Mach number at entry should be around 2 to 2.5. So, the flow when it enters the combustor is supersonic and we are trying to add heat. If the amount of heat that we add, let us say is more than Q star corresponding to this Mach number, then what is likely to happen in this case? you are going to have a normal shock. 
So, if the normal shock occurs and then in this case if the normal shock goes all the way into this intake, then the intake will unstart. The normal shock will propagate all the way here and then it will stand here where it will be very, very strong. So, to prevent that from happening, we have uh, this component here called the isolator. The isolator is a constant area duct. It serves no other function but to allow the normal shock to, if in case you have a normal shock, to come up and stand here and not go into the, propagate into the intake. So, it isolates the combustor and the inlet from each other. So, in case the pressure rise due to heat release is too much, okay, there can be a normal shock and the normal shock and the pressure rise will be contained within the isolator and it will not propagate into the intake, that is the function of the isolator. So, you can see the, uh, yeah. How will you make sure that the normal shock will be in the isolator? If, if we add more heat again, mm. uh, since it is constant area portion, it can uh, again propagate to upstream. Yeah, I mean the remember the isolator is supposed to prevent normal shock from going into the intake for a certain range of operating conditions, okay. So, if the normal shock propagates into the intake and the intake unstarts, that is called an inlet interaction or intake interaction, okay. The isolator will, is not meant to uh, prevent inlet interaction from happening for all conditions. It is meant to prevent this from happening for a certain range of flight conditions, okay. That is what it is designed to do. And remember as you keep increasing the heat release, the normal shock will keep moving further and further upstream. So, we can prevent it from going into the intake for a certain range of values of heat release, okay, but not more than that. We cannot guarantee that the intake will always be isolated from the combustor, that will not be possible because then we have to increase the length of the isolator. And if you increase the length of the isolator, the drag goes up tremendously. The length of the engine goes up and consequently the drag also will go up. And we are talking about hypersonic flight Mach numbers. So, increase in drag is very detrimental to the performance of the vehicle. Yeah. Why to use uh, constant area duct only? We can use divergent portions, no? that will stabilize shock in that portion. Ah, um, there, is, there are packaging constraints, okay. Remember, this and uh, this is a propulsion airframe integrated concept, okay. So, the this surface as you can see from here this intake surface, combustor surface and this surface is determined by the aerodynamics of the vehicle. So, if you want to have an enlarged, uh, enlarged surface here that will have an effect downstream, the nozzle will become smaller. So, the expansion will also be adversely affected. You can have enlargement, but not to the extent not to a large extent in the isolator itself. In fact, I will show you actual designs later on. The combustor will have such uh, divergences to minimize these types of interactions. It is more effective to put it in the combustor rather than in the isolator, okay. Remember, this is propulsion airframe integrated. So, the degree of freedom that we have in changing the underbody of this vehicle is very limited. Because if you, if you, uh, if you are very aggressive in your expansion, if you take this surface, let us say, let us say you put a divergence up to here then the expansion in the nozzle will be reduced by that much, right. This becomes a packaging issue because it is a propulsion airframe integrated device, okay. The, the uh, engine and the airframe share this common surface which is this surface here. So, we are very constrained in what we can do to this surface, okay. So, you can see that the intake in this case in contrast to the intake of the ramjet, here you can see that the intake is supposed to decelerate the flow from 6 Mach number 6 to about 2 to 2.5, typically 2, okay. And the stagnation pressure, free stream stagnation pressure is in this range about 1 to 1.3 ampa. Free stream stagnation temperature as you can see is already quite high. So, we have to be very careful in decelerating this flow. We do not want to end up with temperature, static temperatures much uh, higher than what we want in the combustor itself. Okay, so, we have to be very careful in this deceleration. So, the intake itself has to be designed extremely carefully to decelerate such a flow. So, the ramp has to be designed very carefully to generate a series of oblique shocks which will uh, decelerate the flow, then some reflections inside plus 
uh, converging area passage to accomplish the final divergence, uh, final uh, deceleration to Mach 2 or 2.5 before it goes into the isolator. Okay, so, the intake is also very crucial in this just like the ramjet engine. Now, the next component is the combustor. Normally, when we say combustor in a scramjet engine, we usually mean isolator plus combustor. The isolator is always assumed to be a part of the combustor. Okay, that is what we uh, usually mean and as you can see at entry to the combustor, Mach numbers are usually around 2 to 2.5. Okay. Stagnation pressures are only about 0 0.3 to 0 0.4. If you remember previous slide we said stagnation pressure was 1 MPa. So, you can see that in these types of intakes the stagnation pressure recovery is only about 20 to 30 percent <coughs> in the best of situations. For the ramjets we will have a slightly or not slightly even better ramjet if you remember in your previous calculation we calculated the pressure recovery, stagnation pressure recovery for the ramjet engine to be around 80 percent. Right? In this case typically stagnation pressure recovery will only be between 20 to 30 percent, no more than 30 percent in most cases. Okay? So, <coughs> stagnation temperature remains the same, there is no energy addition or removal here. So, stagnation temperature remains the same, but the most challenging aspect in uh, the designing the combustor has to do with this. The velocity of the flow as it enters the combustor is of the order of about 1.2 kilometer per second. And I showed you the, the physical scramjet vehicle itself, you could, you could surmise from that earlier graphic that the combustor itself is only about, uh, uh, combustor length is only about 1 meter or so, no more than 1 meter. So, flow enters the combustor with a speed of 1.2 kilometer per second and within a distance of 1 meter, we must inject the fuel, mix it with the air, get it to ignite, burn, release the heat before it leaves the combustor. So, that means within a time span of about 1 millisecond, all these processes must take place. Injection, mixing, ignition, completion of combustion in 1 millisecond. That proves to be, that continues to prove to be a great challenge in designing this scramjet vehicle. What we will do in the next class is take a closer look at these challenges and what is being attempted now to address these problems. What, what are the challenges and what is being done to address these issues? That is what we are going to see in the next class.